Hi, uh, my name is I'm John Tlaib, and uh, along with James McGuire, Brett Crocker, and Devin um, again, we are going to be presenting today on emerging markets uh, and microfinance. Microfinance allows the provision of my, uh, financial services, usually in the form of low fund, high interest loans, in an effort to bring impoverished individuals out of poverty. Microfinance is used by a wide variety of entities, such as governments, local credit providers, NGOs, international banks, etc., through microfinancial investment vehicles to provide financial inclusion to emerging markets. The current iteration of microfinance as we know it, uh, as we know it today was created by Dr. Mohammed Yunus to service women in a village in Bangladesh, and his Grameen Bank still provides a major role in microfinance in the nation to this day. The ultimate role of microfinance is to provide financial inclusion through a variety of financial resources to its users so that it might ameliorate their quality of life and guarantee basic financial services to plan for the future and invest it in themselves and as well as, well as, their, as well as their local community. Over the years, the discourse has shifted from microcredit to microfinance, and now widespread concern for financial inclusion is directing attention to the broader financial ecosystem and how to make financial markets work better for the poor. To this end, policymakers have begun to address financial inclusion in their economic agendas with the belief that access to financial services improves the ability to consumers uh, to access markets, which contributes to monetizing values of products and services, enables risk pooling, and allows value storage, thus affecting economic growth and the overall stability of the system. The industry has grown exponentially in terms of both the number of clients as well as the number and type of providers and products. The focus is no longer only on credit for investments in, in micro-enterprises. Today, there is a broad awareness that poor people have many and diverse financial service needs, which are typically met by a variety of providers through multiple financial services. Currently, the greatest successes of the microfinance industry have come from nations that have diversified the services through microfinancial means, provided protection and safe provision for the borrowers, and pledged to a variety of providers of microfinancial services. Microfinance still has many hurdles to overcome, including some issues of denial based on caste, religion, or ethnicity. Perhaps the most daunting challenge to countries that utilize microfinance is the implementation of electronic payment and banking services to those they service. This is due to the lower levels of inf electronic infrastructure. As of 2011, more than 100 microfinance investment vehicles were managing close to $7 billion, making private and quasi-private sector capital readily available. With the recognition that grant funding crowds out the private sector, responsible donors have shifted from providing funds for loan capital and operating subsidies to more of a facilitation role, which supports the development of enabling environments, provision of information, and financial infrastructure. infrastructure. Funding is required by all financial service providers to finance expanded outreach, to develop new products and channels, or to move into new regions and market segments. The majority of direct funding to microfinance is to support portfolio growth, although this may vary depending on the stage of development of the provider being financed. Funders allocate or provide funds directly to financial service providers and intermediaries receive funds from various sources and then invest them in individual providers. The distinction between these two groups is not always completely clear. Banks, for example, intermediate uh, funds they receive as deposits and are therefore usually considered intermediaries. Intermediaries can include microfinance investment vehicles, microfinance holding companies, local apex organizations, and peer-to-peer -peer aggregators. Intermediaries are themselves funded by both public and private investors. Public funders include bilateral agencies, multilateral agencies, development finance institutions, and local government governmental agencies. Private funders include foundations, NGOs, private institutional investors, and private indiv individual investors, both the general public and high net worth individuals as well. Emerging markets are nations with economies with low to middle per capita income. They are classified as transitional because they are in the process of moving into an open market economy while also building accountability with their system. These markets are considered emerging due to their stage of economic development. The goals of the countries are to have stronger economic performance and to have transparency in the market. These markets aim to reform their exchange rate systems because a stable local currency builds confidence in the economy and will give investors incentive to not send their capital abroad. 
An, in, an increase in both local and foreign investment is another characteristic of emerging markets, and they provide businesses with an outlet for expansion. There are 21 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean that have microfinance institutions. The region was tied with East and South Asia with the highest overall score of any region in the Economist Index, with a score of 51 out of 100. The high overall score comes from the region's strong performance in the supporting institutional framework category, and this category's weight makes up 50% of the overall index. The category that Latin America and the Caribbean had the weakest performance in was the regulatory framework and practices category. In 2011, eight out of the top 12 performing countries were in Latin America, with Peru finishing number one and Bolivia number two. There are more than 600 microfinance institutions who have lent around $12 billion to more than 10 million low-income clients. Microfinance is, the, is only available to about one in six potential clients in the region. Peru has one of the most sophisticated microfinance sectors because of the effective supervisory capacity of the superintendency of banking, insurance, and pension funds, and a favorable legal framework that establishes well-defined rules for both regulated and non-regulated microfinance institutions. Accounting and transparency standards are high for regulated and non-regulated MFIs, but transparency with the non-regulated institutions is harder because they sometimes fail to disclose information on lending costs. In the global FINDEX data for the period 2011 to 2014, the Eastern Europe and Central Asia region has also shown minimal growth. There is low variation in microfinance institutions between countries in the region, with the best finisher in the region, Bosnia and Herzegovina, scoring 51, and the lowest finner, finisher, Tajikistan, only a few points behind, with a score of 38. The region does have several particular strengths which shed it apart, notably in fields related to credit. Eastern Europe and Central Asia has the regulation and supervision of credit and is especially strong on the risk management of credit sub-indicator. The region also has the best score credit reporting systems. Eastern Europe and Central Asia are also strong on regulation and supervision of deposit taking activities. The region's relative weaknesses including prudential, regulation or the firm level oversight by regulators of financial institutions. It is also marketably below average on regulation of insurance for low income populations and grievance redress as well as the operation of dispute resolution mechanisms. Perhaps the most notable concern is the political independence of financial regu regulator, where most of the countries in Eastern Europe and Central Asia do poorly. Moreover, no country in the region has a fully implemented comprehensive financial inclusion strategy, which helps explain why the countries of this region tend to score low, below the average uh, for regulation of low income populations. In 2014, the share of adult population, 15 or over, of Russia with an account at a financial institution was 67%, compared to 2011 when it was only at 48%. Of these, women were slightly above the average, at 70%, while young adults aged 15 to 24 were well below the average, at only 54%. Of adults belonging to the poorest 40% and adults living in rural areas, 62% and 61% respectively, had accounts at financial institutions. The landscape of providers consists of three main groups, banks and other credit organizations, non-financial organizations, such as microfinance institutions and credit cooperatives, which can lend but cannot take deposits or give credit, and payment service providers, such as money transfer operators, e-money operators, mobile network operators, and payment agent. South uh, and East Asia happen to be where microfinance has found some of its greatest success. The overall consistency of the region's performance, the increased online and physical infrastructure of the region, and the clarity and availability of policy slash regulations all contribute to the relatively great atmosphere for microfinance to operate successfully in. The greatest problems holding back the region seem to come mostly from ignoring generally accept, uh, accepted accounting principles or GAAP, which makes it harder and riskier for providers of microfinancial services to assist these countries. To look even closer at the region, we can see varying problems and successes throughout. China has succeeded in providing adequate financial inclusion for its population recently but still struggles to regulate and supervise all the microfinancial institutions operating in its country, especially NGOs. In places like Bangladesh, which was where the practice of microfinance originated, not only do we see 88% of, uh, of, of the users of microfinancial services 
make payments on time, but the users of the services are helping their remote villages gain access to solar power and the internet. Places like India, though, cripple their nation's ability to use lives and an incredible growth in M uh, microfinancial institutions in the country by not allowing these institutions to offer deposits, which limits them to microcredit and micro lending opportunities only. In addition to only 14% of the country saving money in a bank account and 6% borrowing from those banks, India is extremely poor financial education nationwide, which makes the overall utility and roles of microfinancial institutions in India, in India more tenuous. Overall, the region has, more, uh, has been making incredible gains annually, but servicing such a geographically and ethnically diverse populations with varying degrees of access and education remains, uh, remains a challenge for microfinancial institutions and governments alike. Overall, the Middle East and North Africa have seen the most improvements, but these could be seen as the first steps in the long journey to financial inclusion. The region has had some uh, isolated strengths in its formal regulations and treatment of institutions. For example, there is good regulation on supervision of deposit-taking activities and strict requirements for non-regulated lenders. However, the regulatory and supervisory capacity of the area raises questions about regional ability to implement these regulations in practice. At the aggregate level, improvements in Sub-Saharan Africa's financial inclusion policy environment are not readily apparent. However, several countries from the region implement policies reasonably well. Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania, and Ghana are all leaders in that regard. A closer look, however, suggests that rather than being middle of the road in financial inclusion terms, the overall results of Sub-Saharan Africa come from a combination of extremely good performance in certain areas and notable weaknesses in others. Looking at Morocco, according to the World Bank in 2014, 41% of Moroccan adults use a formal financial product or service, and microfinance institutions reach about 5% of the adult population. Moreover, the World Bank notes that around 13 million financially excluded adults in the country are disproportionately female, poor, and living in rural areas. The Bank al Maghrib uh, is the central bank of Morocco and has articulated a strong pledge to financial inclusion in its Plan Stratégique 2013. Uh, there's been noted that the Bank of Maghreb is one of the strongest financial regulators in the Arab region um, in promoting financial inclusion and is playing a proactive role in the advancement. The government has been particularly attentive to the possibility of expanding access to banking service through the postal service and mobile financial services. Microfinance has many roles that positively affect society. Those roles include the greater inclusion of women in the financial system and increased ability to engage in financial planning. The extended use of microfinance is generally seen as something that helps bring users out of poverty, as well as income and quality of life among fi microfinance clients is generally thought to improve as well. There are thought to be some negatives to microfinance as well. Some would argue that the costs of microfinance are too high, because the nation is dealing with a large number of small loans, the interest rates can sometimes be high, even some seen up to 36% in some countries. One other concern is unsustainable debt accumulation. Instead of having poverty due to deprivation, countries are left with a large amount of debt, which can sometimes leave a country in even worse conditions than before microfinance. The last threat to society due to microfinancing is the limitations of lending conditions. Loans are for small amounts only and for the short term. This makes microcredit less suitable for some markets that rely on larger loans that may be harder to obtain. Recent research based on randomized controlled trials has found the impact of microcredit to be mixed. Randomized controlled trials have shown that increases in consumption and business investment do not always correlate with measures of poverty reduction. Furthermore, the distribution of gains is uneven. The broader effect of microfinance on poverty is limited by low levels of usage and persistent barriers to inclusion. Looking forward, it appears likely that technology will ena enable customer touch points to proliferate among non-traditional service providers. The technology drivers of financial inclusion will come from innovations in mobile money, biometric identity systems, smartphones, and wireless broadband internet access. At the same time, however, much remains to be learned to effectively increase outreach in a substantial way, including, for example, developing appropriate regulatory frameworks for branchless banking models. Further, it is, vital, it is vitally important to better understand the social dimensions of how households manage financial, financial resources, particularly in the informal sector and the role of technology to work with these social dynamics. 
Microfinance has been proven to provide greater access for financial services for women, as well as increase the quality of life, income, and the ability uh, to financially plan for impoverished individuals. Expanding on the financial planning aspect, users of microfinance have shown a greater ability to be able to save money and send their children to school for longer periods of time and guarantee the potential uh, for the attendance of a place of higher education, possibly. People have definitely escaped poverty through microfinance. Unfortunately, microfinance doesn't seem to tackle problems of both electronic and physical infrastructure, which, is, which are vital for an emerging market to emerge as a first world uh, developed economy. Regions with currencies that are subject to hyperinflation or have high prevalence of the HIV or AIDS virus have shown to be less receptive of the benefits of microfinance. Finally, not all governments are receptive to microfinance, and in general, promoting economic policy that would entice local and foreign investment across the board. These arbitrary restrictions hurt microfinance's ability to lift individuals out of poverty and ameliorate quality of life.